hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bibliophiles. This is the program on AADL TV, where each episode, the three of us take some time to choose a book and talk about a book from one topic. And today's topic is a book that you picked for the cover. Uh, I'm Lucy, and as always, I'm here with Christopher and Amanda, and I'm excited to see the covers of the books that grabbed you. So, um, Amanda, what did you choose? All right. So picking a book for its cover, I didn't know how to approach it. So I decided just to go to like the tall stack of books I had at home that I had checked out from the library and then just look at them and see which one drew me in. And I picked this one. This one is called Lessons for Survival, Mothering Against the Apocalypse by Emily Rabitow. And it's got this gorgeous bird on the cover. It's just so colorful and bright. And this was kind of a departure from what I usually read, but I must have liked it because I put it on hold and it became ready for me. Um, the book is new. It was published in March of 2024, and it's a collection of essays. Um, it's a collection of essays on race, climate change, environmental justice, and parenting slash mothering. Um, so I'm going to read what the author, a couple things the author has said to describe her book. She does it much better than I would. Um, she says, I would describe my book as a mosaic essay collection. It's like a quilt. There are light motifs, operating metaphors, and recurring images that I hope help stitch the parts together. Water, birds, parks, dinner tables, and signs. And that is sort of what her essays are about. She also says that I see the book as a series of pilgrimages seeking enlightenment on how to handle existential threats. So the book is divided into five different sections and they range in different years. I think the earliest one may have been 2015. I don't know how late they go, 21, 22. Um, but it doesn't matter. It's nice to read them in order because you kind of build upon the information that she's sharing. But she starts out like when she was early stages of being pregnant, like during her baby shower. And then the first essay that like sucked me in and drew me in was when she discussing the bird murals she was discovering in New York. Um, the, the author, she's a fiction writer, she's an essayist, and she is a creative writing professor at the City College in New York. So that's where she lives. Um, there's this really cool project. It is called the National, it's called, what is it called? The Audubon Mural Project. And the project is inspired by the paintings of John James Audubon, and it's energized by findings from the National Audubon Society that nearly half of all of North American birds, these species, face dire threats to their survival by 2080 due to climate change. So the project commissions artists to create these murals of each of the threatened birds. There's 314 total, and it's not done at the time of the book was published, and even now they're not done. And so the author writes about just happening upon these birds, and the birds are painted on these door fronts the exteriors of these places around Northern Manhattan and people who've been to Northern Manhattan have probably seen these, but there are a lot of them around those like pull down sheds that out that shops have. Um, so she was discovering these birds and then she learned about the project and she just started like finding them all over the place. Um, so she talks a lot about the bird murals. There's also another um, project that she stumbles upon where somebody has these giant traffic signs with climate change messages on them. And those are more spread out across New York. And she meets this, person at a park and they end up exploring together to see these traffic signs. So while she's out and about, you know, exploring New York and meeting people and discovering and admiring this art, she's also thinking about like her kids and how her kids are. Um, she talks about her physical chronic pain that she's experiencing. Um, the author is biracial herself. So she, there's one essay where she talks about giving her kids the talk, um, worrying about them growing up as black kids in, um, uh, present time and in the future. She also talks about when she and her siblings were given the talk when they were younger. She talks about the intersection of race and climate change, which is a big, big part of the book. Um, the, one of the neatest chapters to me, there was an essay that uh, was notes at different dinner parties she attended for a single year. And they're all little short, little three sentence blurbs, but different notes of climate change discussion at these dinner parties. So just like a couple sentences that somebody said sounds random, but put together, it kind of paints a larger picture, which is really cool to see. She writes about a trip to Palestine. She writes about a trip to Alaska. There's a three month diary of like the beginning of 2020 when COVID was happening. Um, and I don't really like reading about COVID, but it exists. It is, it is alive in the world. Um, 
So she has a short, there's only three months journal talking about those, but she talks about um, the, the, what they call COVID grief and how it resembles climate grief. So it's kind of this cool intersection. Um, and there's also a really lovely essay when she talks about like her father's being sick and her father dying, which is really touching. So there's a lot going on in the book, but I love the overarching themes that she has of like with these water and these birds and the climate and race. And it, it's just really, really well done. The author is such a gifted writer and I hadn't read anything by her before. She has a couple other books. Um, just really, really well done. And the topics are kind of all over the place as is my description of them. Um, but it's just really nice. It's it's he it's heavier to read about because it's real and it's happening. And it talks about some of the injustices where like the water shortage and what is happening to different parts of the country, different parts of the world, what they are experiencing, how climate change is affecting them. So there's just, it's a really, really cool book. And I was really glad I read it. I do highly recommend it. Um, yeah, it talks a lot about being a mother and her sons and what she's going to do with them in the future. So really, really fascinating. Uh, Lessons for Survival, Mothering Against the Apocalypse by Emily Robitaille. That's my book I judged for the cover because of this gorgeous bird on the cover. Um, Christopher, what book did you pick? Well, I have to tell you that I started with a different book and I thought this book was going to be perfect. I set up some criteria such as I didn't know who the author was um, and I knew nothing about a book. So I was wandering through the library and I found a book and the cover grabbed me and the title grabbed me and I opened it up and it was short stories and they were all set outside the United States. And I thought, oh, man, this book is perfect for me. And I was reading it and I didn't care for it. So I put it back on the shelf and found something else. I was wandering through the library and this cover grabbed me. <laughs> Olaf Hayek, and it's called Flower Power, and it is a huge book that is uh, folk illustrations of different flowers with these beautiful and wonderful descriptions of each flower through history. When I say it's a description, you know, it's really a page of text that matches the picture. But it has one of my favorite features in books, which is it's this kind of all-encompassing, far-reaching story of all these different flowers and their effects through history and in culture. So there's Roman mythology in the section on the artichoke. There is a story of how pineapples spread and why in so many European languages they're all referred to as the same word, ananas or anana or something like that. It comes from a... Um, I think it's a South American language, Guarani, and Columbus brought the pineapple to uh, to Europe. Uh, there are lots of stories about Hildegard von Bingen, who I didn't realize was such a botanist and her whole plant history. And I'm reading a book by Rebecca Solnit right now called Orwell's Roses, and it's a lot about roses. So I was so happy to see a section in this book about roses as well. I must have flowers or plants <laughs> or something on the brain with uh, gardening season coming. And it also has one of my favorite plants, Mary Thistle. And I had never heard that term before. I always called it Scottish Thistle because I grow so many thistles in the easement, much to my neighbor's chagrin, I'm sure. So you get through all of this. And in the very back, there is a little blurb about the illustrator. And the illustrations are gorgeous. And then it ends with, now we need to know what some of those words mean because the text is about some of the, the um, inspirations for the illustrator. And so it gives you some information about art history and other things that uh, played a role in the illustrator's life. So I love it. Uh, it was a really nice departure from thicker, heavier books that I usually read, but I wanted something light and the cover really, really drew me in. So that is Olaf Hayek's flower power. Lucy? <laughs> um, both of those books sound great. I just wrote them down. I want to read both of them. Um, and they're so different. So, and they're both nonfiction. I actually picked something fiction. Amanda, I did what you did. I looked at what I had on my shelf, actually like what I owned, which, and um, 
was like pulling things out because their spine was interesting. And then when I found a cover and then I was excited because I found the cover of a book, it's um, a newish book by an author. I've read her first book. So this is called Anita DeMonte Laughs Last. It's by Zoshidal Gonzalez. And this just came out in March, 2024. And I just like, of all the covers I laid out there, this one was just like so cool with this. Um, and then when you read the book, you realize like, why there's a woman kind of behind all these windows. And so it is the story of two different women in two different timelines. Um, the first one is named Anita DeMonte. And she is an artist in the 80s, a Latina artist. Um, and she's really like, trying to break out in that white Eurocentric art world, male art world. She um, is married to a very famous artist named Jack. And he sort of just like really shadows her, but she gets out from under him and starts to gain fame. And um, he this is like in the eight, mid eighties. He really doesn't like that. And he doesn't want to be the the husband of somebody, you know, she wants her to be, she's like this token sort of um, the one representative artist. And it, it just talks a little bit about like, um, you know, sexism and feminism and trying for females to try and find a place in like a very male world, which the art world was. And then like the lack of, of non Eurocentric art and, the book starts though, it's the two sections, hers are narrated from the first person point of view and the first chapter of the first book, she falls out of a window and dies. So you're getting that from her point of view. And that that narrative voice turns out to be like a stroke of genius on the author's part because she's telling us her story after she's died and she'll go back and forth in time and you learn about all these different times in her life. But she also, um, like the less people talk about her, the the more her, she loses an ability to haunt anybody, you know, like the less anyone looks at her art, the less the like her art, there's going to be a retrospective of her art and her husband, her ex-husband, um, like gets it, you know, taken down and, and he sort of starts to erase her name from history. The reason for that is that he was accused of murdering her and he went on trial and he got off and that is all based on a, a true story of an artist named Anna Magneta, who was married to a famous artist and he, she was, she fell out of a window and died. And he went to trial, I think three times. The author of the book discovered this when she was a student at Brown and she was an art history student. And she came across this artist, Anna Magneta, and then she started to read the story. And so she, it's this mirroring of that, this unearthing. Um, and there is the same sort of unearthing of, Anita de Monte in this book. And so she doesn't lose her ability to get to haunt because someone sort of rediscovers her. What she does though is she turns, she can turn into a bat. And it sounds, you know, it's like it's magical realism, but it's not, it's just kind of like she's just that's what she does. And if it hadn't been narrated from the first person point of view, it would have been like, wait, this is just this person turning into a bat. But because it's from her point of view, it just sort of makes sense. And because when she's a bat, she can be really effective at like flying into the house of her ex-husband and, you know, getting caught in his hair, or kind of going after his face. Um, same thing with the woman that he's dating now. And so she doesn't, um, she doesn't want to be erased and she wants to be remembered through her artwork. So the second part of the story takes place in the nineties and it's a student at Brown. Her name's Raquel and she is um, one of very few Brown women at Brown and she's an art history student and she's working on her thesis and she's really excited to study the work of this man, Jack, this white artist who in um, her thesis advisor loves this artist and as she starts digging deeper, she thinks like, why am I, why is this the world I'm focusing on? At the same time, she starts dating somebody, uh, a white man, and he sort of starts to dictate how she acts like you're too loud, your hair is too much, you need to lose some weight. And he's really rich. And she kind of starts to do that. And so it's this parallel to Anita DeMonte's story about like, women kind of shrinking, you know, and getting erased and really in, in the service of men. And so she 
studying Jack farther and she unearths Anya, Anna Magneta, uh, not Anna Magneta, Anita Diamante. She unearths her and starts to study her art and decides she's going to do her thesis on that. And that is a long way to tell you about it. that doesn't, but anyway, so then you realize that maybe this artist won't disappear. And so it's a really great book. It's got great characters. The plot really moves, but it's also about this like much bigger idea of women in history and trying to, you know, find your way out of isolation and make your voice heard and, and be recognized for your contribution and for yourself and not to be erased. But um, the one last thing I'll say is I was listening to an interview with the uh, author and she was saying the reason she said it when she did was that she went to, to Brown in that time. So that made sense to her. She could talk about that world. But the other thing is, and I've seen this more frequently in books, is that she wanted to write a book before the time of uh, like cell phones and everybody having access to email because that can change the plot of something so much. And I feel like this is not the first book I've read recently where that has come up. So that's just kind of interesting to be in this time period and see how books are shifting based on not wanting to include current technologies in them. So that is Anita DeMonte Laughs Last by Zoshito Gonzalez. And it was a really great read. It was quick. I'm glad that this cover drew me in. Um, I really enjoyed it. So does anyone else have anything to say about books with great covers? Well, you both sold me on both of those titles. They both sound fantastic. Wow. Uh, great topic. I know I say that a lot, but... <laughs> Well, that's the best part is we're recommending each other books and long with yeah. everybody watching, I was like, oh, I got to write that down. And we read each other's books and then we're like, oh, I read that one. Um, yeah. Christopher, your sounds really cool. I love all the flower. The That sounds awesome. And Lucy, I actually, I checked that book out before. I didn't read it. It sat on my stack and I had to return it, but yeah, gorgeous cover. I was drawn to yeah. that. Yeah. And her first book, um, Olga Laughs Last also had a great cover, which, and it was also very good, but yeah, I was glad that like on the shelf I was looking at this was there when it was a win for me so yeah. three out of three <laughs> yeah all right well that is uh, another episode of bibliophiles and as always we would love to hear from you you can comment below if there's a book that you picked just because of the way the cover looked and it was a great find or like Christopher you found a book and you picked it because of the cover and you didn't like it we want to hear that too so um until next time thanks for joining us